In the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful, may the peace and blessings of God be upon you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to welcome you to this seminar, which is co-organized between Qatar University and the BDC Doha Brookings Center which is entitled The Gulf Crisis and the Region. As you know, there is an acute crisis that is being lived by the GCC countries in all aspects of life. This kind of uh, crisis that has been proven to it is based on uh, fabrications that are not justified, that are not realistic, uh, neither to the state of Qatar nor the Emirates, uh, the KSA, Bahrain, and Egypt. It was proceeded by a blockade to the state of Qatar by those countries and an imposition and dictations of conditions that are a precedent that are very dangerous when it comes to regional relations, if not international relations. Yes, it is natural to have disparities, uh, competition, uh, differences uh, between the different countries countries uh, due to the fact that there are uh, differences in strategies and opinions, uh, but very seldom this uh, can lead to what we see today, a blockade that is not justified, uh, an imposition of conditions uh, to a member state which is uh, a partner in a number of uh, organizations such as the League of Arab States, uh, the GCC, and also the OIC, in addition to other international and regional agencies and organizations. This uh, comes with no precedence, with no reasons uh, that would lead to such kind of behavior that is very much uh, shocking, that is very much uh, uh, uncalled for, I mean, an escalation vis-a-vis -vis a neighboring country. So uh, the fact uh, that we are surprised does not stop here. It goes beyond that. It goes beyond uh, to the extent that we look into the behavior that was used and also the conditions that have been put at the table for those countries, by those countries. And in addition to that, also the impact, the harm that has been undertaken, the repercussions and ramifications of this uh, on the state of Qatar and also regional states uh, when it comes uh, to the individual level or uh, uh, group level and also regional organizations in addition to other impacts economically, politically, socially and from a human perspective. What is very much of concern here uh, that this comes at a time where there are a number of crises and challenges, including uh, the combating of terrorism, the aftermath of the Arab, stra uh, the Arab Spring, sectarian uh, fights, seditions, and also issues, and also the retreat of the prices of oil. This crisis comes at a very acute uh, period of time. The least that was expected is to find a way of cooperation, complementarity of relations in order to combat these challenges and not to have divisions and also splintering relations that is going to be of no use to the different members. It is only, only going to be harmful to our friends and it is going to serve our enemies. In our seminar, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have four topics. We're going to talk about the impact of this crisis on the regional system and the uh, regional relations. We have with us here Dr. Shafiq Al-Ghabra. And secondly, the impact of the crisis on the GCC. And our speaker is going to be Naif, Dr. Naif Bin Nahar from Qatar University. Dr. Shafiq Al-Ghabra is from Kuwait University. Also, the third topic is the repercussions of this crisis on the security and stability of the region. And we're going to have with us here Dr. Ibrahim Freyhat from Doha Institute for Graduate Studies. And last but not least, we're going to have with us Dr. Nadir Qabani, who is 
Director of Research from Brookings Doha Center, the BDC, who is going to talk about the economic ramifications of this crisis on the region. Before we start, uh, before we start with the different themes of today's seminar, I would like to talk about a number of procedural aspects. As you know, this seminar is being broadcast live on Al Jazeera Mubashir, and we would like to thank them for that. In addition to that, there is a hashtag on Twitter, which is uh, Gulf Crisis for those who want to follow the seminar that is taking place here. And uh, before we give the floor to Dr. Shafiq Ghabra, I would like uh, to remind the, the distinguished uh, audience, large number of audience. I am sure they have so many questions, so many opinions they would like to express. Uh, in addition to that, they want uh, to hear your opinions, but at the same time, we would like to listen to their opinions as well. So the more concise we are in our interventions, the more it is going to be uh, fruitful. And after that, we're going to give the opportunity to the audience to intervene. I'm going to be very strict with regard to time allocated to each speaker. I'm going to give the floor to Dr. Shafiq Ghabra, who is going to talk about the regional repercussions of this crisis. May the peace and blessings of God be upon you all. I salute you here and I express my appreciation here to both the BDC and Qatar University for inviting me and for convening this very important seminar. Personally speaking, I would like to say that on the 5th of June of this year, I woke up here in Doha where I was spending a research period of one year here in the Arab Center for Research. The day was a different day. We have seen the closing of the borders, uh, land borders, the only borders available, and also uh, so many uh, decisions, resolutions that have been taken and uh, we have seen also that the nationals uh, of those countries that have imposed the blockade have asked their nationals to leave the state of Qatar and also we have noticed and seen that those countries have uh, decided to sever relations with the state of Qatar and there was a media campaign that is unprecedented being uh, waged on the state of Qatar. This was not to be believed. On the 5th of June I felt uh, that I was in Kuwait uh, I, this reminded me to the uh, reminded me of the year 1990, uh, the year that uh, in which we the year before the invasion, uh, the move, uh, the action that was undertaken by the Emir of Kuwait uh, was very useful. I said uh, that there is somebody who tries uh, to reach pacification in this crisis, knowing that Kuwait has been subjected to a crisis similar to that. It was subjected to a more dangerous crisis in, 19, in the 90s. Uh, so this has led me to have some kind of relative uh, optimism, but uh, uh, we have seen that uh, Turkish parliament has taken resolutions, military resolutions, and this has tipped the balance. Uh, we have seen the role of Turkey, the uh, Kuwaiti mediation, and we have seen that the crisis has been uh, given a very important dimension. So we have seen a certain balance that has been stricken here as a result of that. And also Iran has proposed that it can give its uh, airspace to the state of Qatar. It can uh, provide the food provisions for the state of Qatar. And Qatar was very much steadfast. So in a wink of a lie, uh, uh, in the wink of an eye, we have seen uh, the differences in situation. They have been meeting for in excess of 20 years, opening markets, talking about GCC unity and also opening the opportunity for investment. This underlines that there is a problematic issue when it comes to dealing with differences. And this uh, takes me back uh, to the uh, when uh, they 
were shaking hands uh, in a meeting that was uh, convened just days before that. And also uh, Malik Salman, who was in Doha, cooperation in Iraq, in Syria. These countries uh, have been supporting the same groups uh, that are called uh, according to certain designations that they are terrorists. So how can this happen? Since the beginning of this uh, crisis on the 5th of June, these countries that are blockaded in the state of Qatar have realized and when we talk about uh, Hisar, it is blockade. Uh, so we can't find another another word. It is a blockade. It is a siege. Hisar in the Arabic language. These countries that are blockaded in the state of Qatar, uh, they realize that they have to come up with justifications uh, to convince the international community, the world, that there is a crisis in a very flared up area in which there are wars. There was no list of indictment or accusations. This shows the irrationality of the crisis. The world was not convinced with the different claims that have been included in this media campaign when it comes to terrorism. And they were not also convinced and persuaded that the state of Qatar is, Ira is with Iran against the GCC. So in this crisis, we're going to find that President Trump contributed the, to the escalation that took place, his letters, his messages in the different social media. And the crisis also showed that uh, different institutions, renowned institutions in the US, uh, have had their own opinions, which struck, strike a balance between the different uh, facades of the United States of America. We were not used to have such kind of differences of opinion in such a manner. The crisis has impacted the interests of all countries. There is no disagreement on that, uh, the countries of the GCC. So we should have learned uh, from the experience of Europe and its relationship with Britain, its uh, civilizational relations, maybe that would have been better for them. And it was realized that there is no future for the GCC without having a mechanism that should be built in order to find a solution to crises, to differences in which the people of those countries should take part. And we should isolate the economy from any other political differences. I think in this crisis, uh, the state of Qatar realized that there is a new kind of uh, situation, uh, scenario. So they have tried to set a new form of relationship between Qataris, between them themselves intra-relations and also they have developed it has led to the development of relations between the state of Qatar the nationals of the state of Qatar and other expats living in the state of Qatar this is considered a kind of a new birth upon which we can build a great deal and as a result of the blockade and as a result of GCC and Arabic uh, Arab countries moving from community <coughs> communication to animosity Turkey has become present militarily in the GCC and there are new means of transportation, new routes, new uh, communications and new uh, relations economically. And uh, now it is dealing with uh, Iran for food provision and this is a new situation that imposes that we should deal with our brothers as if it is an island within the sea. Maybe this is going to impose a new strategy in the coming phases. Uh, so it is not logical when we try to revisit this crisis. We cannot accept that Al Jazeera is going to be the reason behind the crisis. Media reflects the incidents and it is very strange to say that it is the reason behind this crisis. I think that media reflects part of the reality, part of the truth and does not make the truth or make the reality. If we believe that it is media that makes up the situation. Uh, maybe in the future they're going to have a crisis with London as a result of the BBC or maybe with the CNN and so on and so forth. All these stations, all these media outlets, they talk about the situation. So to talk about Al Jazeera as one of the demands, this is the height of weakness for those countries. Uh, so those countries, uh, they were part of uh, the system. They are part of the Arab uh, 
system uh, group uh, from Morocco uh, to other countries in the East. Uh, so when you think that you can put an end to a movement uh, through repressive ways, uh, we have so many movements that are uh, retreated and maybe retreating and maybe they're going to be uh, not accepted by people. But you have to let the voice of the people to prevail and not to use your own repressive means and tools. Uh, so to say that Hamas is a terrorist organization to organ to justify what is taking place. This uh, minimizes and uh, reduces the importance of those countries. Uh, and we're talking about resistance and the different dimensions of resistance in the different countries of the Arab world. We talk about uh, the position of uh, King Faisal for prayer in Jerusalem and also his position in 1973 and stopping of oil exportation to other countries. So there is a difference in this position. One most important aspect when it comes to this crisis vis-a-vis the situation. This is a cover uh, for uh, a battle against uh, rights, uh, against liberties, against uh, uh, citizens. Citizens want to be part and parcel of political partnership. This was very clear in this crisis. In essence, uh, there is no terrorism without detention centers, without occupation, such as the Israeli occupation. Terrorism prevails when there are so many nationals in prisons, when you have so many people who are detaining peaceful demonstrators uh, who are waging go uh, wars and who are having occupation in different countries. We can only achieve a good situation when there is a kind of conformity between the different uh, entities and also to give them the scope for a political intervention. This is the responsibility of political and economic reform in our region. Yes, we have to pay heed here and we say that there is no static situation in our region. What we see today is not going to remain. Things change gradually, change, sorry, change continuously. There might be a disparity and uh, Trump might come in a day and maybe leave the White House and maybe we see a new wave with new predicaments. Maybe we can see developments in the war in Yemen and also the relationship between Syria and Iran. So the situation is not static in the Arab world. Things are changing. We live in a changing and transforming uh, tr transforming uh, transforming, sorry, and transformative kind of situation. So pressure is going to continue to lift uh, uh, pressure and the blockade on the state of Qatar. We're going to have scores of cases in the different uh, uh, courts. So the legitimacy of this uh, uh, situation is going to change due to the positions of different parts of the world, of the great powers of the world, uh, and also manipulating this region with different strategies. Uh, so the solution of the crisis, uh, I think we need uh, to rely on the individuality of the Kuwaitis, of the Qataris, the Emirat Emiratis, even, even the Emirates, uh, they were... Uh, able to do that in the past. They were able to put a veto on uh, a joint GCC currency because they disagreed on the headquarter of this currency. And also Oman also was sponsoring the different negotiations. So there is no harm when it comes to Al Jazeera to having critics. Uh, I think the harm is when you become a person or a country that tries to exercise economic and political monopoly what is best for us in this region is to listen to the voice of the other, the critical voice, and try to seek justice within countries and between countries, which paves the way for political, economic, and democratic openness. This is something that we are in dire need of in our region. Thank you so much. Is that right? Uh, thank you, Dr. Shafiq, uh, and I am sure that you have a lot to say, but time is uh, very narrow. There is a question that pops up in our minds and also uh, for you. Why is this a crisis? Why now? Why is was fabricated in this way? You have mentioned some of the reasons, Al Jazeera, relation with Iran, terrorism, uh, and all these things, but 
up till this moment, I didn't find or I haven't found anyone who can say that this is the real reason behind this crisis. Dr. Shafiq, do you have a perception about this topic? What is the main reason? What is the main cause behind this crisis? Nobody knows. It's still, this is unknown, actually, because you may just put elements for this crisis, many elements behind this crisis. You may say the, uh, the existence of a Trump in the House have has uh, given some ideas to the others, uh, the feeling that he, they can do something and things will go in a, in, in a certain way or in a certain scenario. The availability or the existence of a Trump could be a, a factor for that. The status quo in the, uh, in the Arab world since the year 2011, the differences in the perceptions that no one can see that the Arab world cannot be restored to be as before in 2011, as if nothing has happened in, G in uh, Syria, in Egypt, in uh, Algeria, where the, at the same time there is another school in the Arab world that there is a new Arab Spring uh, will, uh, will take place in the future. Something that we can go back to the state that existed before the two, to 2011, but things have changed. All economic, social things, different things have changed with negatives and with positives. So. At the same time, there are others who believe in the creation or expect a new creation of a social and economic status in the Arab world. We don't know. Surprises are on the way in the Arab world. Therefore, this crisis is part of these surprises. It is part of the transformation. And uh, there are other leaderships or uh, who uh, maybe they think differently and they behaved in this way. Uh, this reflects the crisis uh, with others and the crisis in their uh, blockading uh, countries. There is a controversy and there is a dilemma in freedom in change in the popular current with the human rights and the Trump became as a, an opportunity to decide what we want and to end what we want. And uh, the uh, crisis is part of, of that. If you just look at the history and the blockade over uh, Iran and the embargo against Iran under international uh, bunny, uh, uh, blockade, these things have made Iran stronger. So I think there is individualism in thinking and we do not go to the conflict, we do not go to wars, but at the same time, how did we go to Yemen war? Uh, also, it was during Abdel Nasser days in 1967. How did Saddam go and invaded Kuwait? This is individual, this is without the participation of peoples or institutions. We, we may imagine that the United States is there and the Trump is there, but no one institution is telling him no. Otherwise, he would invade half of the world. Thank you. Doctor, do you think that uh, not understanding those causes behind this crisis uh, have uh, led to the unavailability of solutions for this crisis? And if there are solutions, what would be they? I, the, so the, maybe the best strategy in this case, in my own opinion, and uh, Qatar with this, uh, under this pressure, it uh, behaved courageously and bravely, and it can uh, work on the long run to develop its economy, potentials, independence, and to liberate itself from any restrictions going in that direction. If you say that there are solutions, I, I tell you that the, the crisis is now at the peak and uh, there is a great escalation. If the military interference or if the military option has been put aside due to the many alliances, so it is a media escalation, and the media escalation will, will not harm or will not do anything. The, there will not be more escalation other than this. Therefore, we need to look for to uh, rationalize the differences, and this will take a long time because it looks to me that the perceptions now are different, though they, and they are quite clear. 
how can the blockage be lifted uh, or eased the human dimensions international mediation even russia now uh, russia has nothing to do with the humanity and now it has become a mediator among the gcc countries uh, other only Assad is left to to to, to act as a mediator Today we are in a very painful situation, and in other, in other words, it's quite nonsense as Arabs, especially the GCC countries that used to be quite rationally, quite wise, to reach this case. But here, Qatar has to face this state and to do its best. And I think that Qatar is smart enough to keep going in this uh, line and should not panic, should not be tensioned, and to open different thoughts and to be to keep itself open to give and take with all mediations and mediators and it is not conditional that uh, the differences should end maybe differences between France and Britain did not end in one or two years but there was uh, but there were not any restrictions on more people's movement uh, or in Germany or as in Hitler days this is what i think there is something that has happened and maybe the, uh, the upcoming events in the region may clarify the controversies. There could be certain retreats, uh, maybe new perceptions in the countries that are uh, imposing the blockade among uh, countries. Maybe there would be other different perceptions among those countries, other conflicts in the region. So nothing is constant in the area. So the reality is very changing and the prices are there for therefore analysis uh, will include any uh, any potential or any surprise thank you dr shafiq it is sure there are other questions will come from the audience uh, later on and you have mentioned the gcc and now our uh, colleague dr naif if you like to talk here or if you Okay, okay, you should, okay, let, let me go to the podium. Dr. Naif, he is from Qatar University, he will touch upon or about the impacts of the uh, Gulf crisis on the GCC Council and the Gulf system. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful, praise always be to Allah, prayers be on our noble prophet and his companions. I would like to salute to the Islam, peace and the blessings and Allah's mercy be on you. You are most welcome. And as Dr. Abdullah said uh, minutes ago, a large audience, and maybe I don't say that unexpected audience, uh, but if the Gulf crisis has some positives, there has been a good understanding among the Qatari youth who felt the problem and this and this crisis and they are now opting to follow up on the political scene so it is not quite odd if a large audience uh, this large audience uh, audience comes to attend such uh, seminars in the past we could have seen just a few number or a small number of attendees but now the audience is quite large dr abdullah asked me about the impacts of the crisis on the gcc country i say the contrary <laughs> if i have the right to say maybe the gcc council uh, uh, permitted the uh, creation or the fabrication of this uh, uh, crisis other if it is not uh, following this structure this crisis wouldn't have been there because the gcc used to suffer from different controversies and they have not been cured over many decades now uh, therefore the door was open to create such a crisis uh, there were many problems in the gcc council and the biggest problem and the crisis and uh, that the gcc council suffered it is a gcc for cooperation more than 36 years and the leaders uh, leaderships of the gcc countries meet annually uh, and they share the religion culture identity uh, where all ties come together that can create substantial alliances they exist in the gulf 36 of constant meetings to create this course where is the cooperation cooperation is an objective or a goal to any other country but not for countries like the gc countries that their existence is a strategy you are between two countries now there is iraq uh, during saddam days um, and 
uh, and all the people becomes military uh, and there is Iran that has its own project and expansionist country. So, and the existence of the GCC countries that have not, that has not reached a full unity and it has not lived up to the level of union allowed this crisis to happen. If the GCC developed its mechanisms and business and uh, if, there ha if there is a political difference to come between people or among peoples of the Gulf, so to cure this uh, crisis, should be tackled so that to avoid other conferences. Among the problems in the GCC Council, there is not a unified definition of the regional security. What does regional security? We need to agree on the enemy. Who is the enemy for the GCC? There is no one answer at the, at the, in, the, in all countries. And so this is a system that does not agree on who is their enemy. How can they succeed? How they cooperate? How can you cooperate with me, whereas you consider your enemy is not my enemy, and vice versa? I I challenge uh, the GCC to issue a communique, a statement saying who is the enemy. I challenge the GCC to issue a statement saying Iran is enemy or Israel is enemy. There is no agreement. Is Bashar al-Assad the enemy? No. So you do not agree on the minimum, which is security and security definitions. And so how, uh, what about other things? This dilemma, this controversy, and to agree on uh, one definition for the regional security, if we just, uh, we could uh, understand why there are other crisis problems. Now they accuse Qatar of abusing or of threatening the Saudi security and the Emirates security. When Qatar becomes a threat for the regional security, how? Because they just host some uh, people from or some figures from the uh, Brotherhood. On what basis we categorize brothers, Muslim Brotherhood as enemies? Because you have a different definition. Who told or who says that one of the security threatens is the uh, threats is the Muslim Brotherhood? Who convinced the Saudi leadership or the Emirate leadership that the Muslim Brotherhoods are enemies? So there is the unavailability of a clear definition for the regional security in the region caused the or stance behind such crises and problems. Other problems in the GCC, uh, the, um, the, the, the peoples do not participate in the political decision. We, uh, we cannot beautify the thing away from the real reason. Dr. Shafiq uh, a few minutes ago said that, uh, that, 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 that Trump, uh, he, was, he was described by Rex Tillerson yesterday that he just represented personal uh, opinion. Uh, no. Who would have prevented Trump uh, from drawing the foreign policy of the United States? Because there are institutions in the United States. Now in the Gulf, the issue is different. The decision is by the ruler. The decision is the individual. And what is the role of other peoples? What, are, what is the role of the elites in other countries that have weight? When there is a crisis, the, they have no weight. They have no impact. Only one person has the impact or the weight. If we want to tackle these crises and to ensure that these crises will not happen again, we need to solve this. That uh, there is no one definition for the region uh, for the uh, regional security, and people do not participate in the uh, in the makeup of the political decisions. As long as these problems exist, there will be other problems. Maybe this crisis will end, but there are, there are other crises on the way. If you want to close the door before all the crises, you have to you have to deal and address these shortcomings. But this crisis, actually, if there were certain problems in the GCC Council, after this crisis, we went to other crises and mistakes. The blockading countries internationalize uh, the, the Gulf uh, crisis. Despite the speech of uh, Adil al jubair the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Saudi Arabia, saying that it is a Gulf-Gulf uh, uh, crisis, 
maybe the green light came from the White House. You you remember the visits paid to the White House by some of the Gulf uh, leaders, and after that, inclusion of Egypt. What is the relation of Egypt in the GCC Council affairs? Uh, why is not it is within the framework of the Gulf? You are saying that this is a Gulf Gulf uh, crisis, and then they say that uh, it is a Gulf Arab. Uh, crisis. If you are not convinced with the Gulf framework, will not harm Qatar. Qatar has not been uh, affected at the international level. If Qatar has spent millions and millions, it would not be famous uh, or would not be uh, very famous in the world. Who suffered from the problem? Because Saudi, Saudi Arabia. Because Saudi Arabia, it is known as the most demonetic country or the biggest country in the GC. And when the crisis became at the international level, it should have been solved within the Gulf uh, House. If you have a problem with your uh, youngest son, you can tackle it within your home or within your house. But if you uh, and if you just there is a problem with, between you and your uh, youngest brother, and you go to the court people will know about that. Qatar has proved to the world that it cannot be uh, under the umbrella of any uh, uh, other country. So this is, a biggest, this is the biggest mistake that the blockading countries committed. The second mistake, they just uh, rendered the uh, crisis at the popular level, at the people's level. No. Who is conflicting now? Maybe politicians do not mean in the Gulf. No, the people, peoples now who exchange abuses, and, and this is a complete incinerator for the, uh, the, the, the peoples of the Gulf. Moving or shifting the differences from the political level to the popular level burns any common ground in the Gulf for any future business or any future cooperation. And this also helped to lose the trust among the peoples of the Gulf. Uh, after a while, after the crisis and the abuse of people to each other, there will be no trust. Qataris will not uh, trust Saudis, and Saudis will not uh, trust Qataris and the Emirates. So uh, the, the, the hostility, hostility and conflict will be a culture in the Gulf. Uh, as because there will be a preoccupation that uh, Saudi is an enemy or the Emirates is losing the trust and the confidence between peoples is more dangerous than losing trust among politicians and rulers because rulers change and but who will change the people people so that people can trust the person. The, if you just burn your common ground upon which you build any future business uh, if Saudi Arabia now goes into a conflict with uh, uh, with Iran, and it has to mobilize the public opinion, which public opinion would go with Saudi Arabia? Now you you just mobilize the public opinion against Yemen, but now the uh, picture is different. So, one minute, please. I would say to end this crisis, or what is required now, actually, first we need to segregate. We need to alienate the peoples, and we just face the crisis through the diplomatic and political channels. And this requires to have a good, we have a little media and much politics. But the problem today is there is much media and little politics, and little politics. So we need to reduce the media. We need to minimize the media and the social media who are just uh, escalating the problem and the crisis. And let's open the diplomatic and the political channels so that to minimize the crisis. And as it is, the crisis as it is will not be solved. Maybe later I will talk, but in this way, there is a great escalation. The Gulf rulers, uh, they are people. You are just uh, and the, the decision makers. How can we solve this problem if the media is doing like that? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Naif, for your kind intervention. I have got a number of uh, 
questions, and I would like to start with one pivotal question. You talked about differences. The differences have come due to the fact that the GCC Council, the different institutions of the Council, are not able to solve these uh, differences. We cannot uh, transform, or the GCC was not able to transform itself to a union. Had there been a union, do you think those differences would have ended? So the problem does not lie in the title or the name of this gathering. I think it lies in the way this institution is being managed, the different mechanisms, how these mechanisms are being activated. In the GCC, for instance, today, there is an authority for dispute resolution, but it has not been activated in intra-GCC problems. So how can we move into a union kind of system and how would that find solution to the problem? Many talk about the idea that the state of Qatar might withdraw from the GCC or might be forced to do that. What is your opinion? Nobody can force the state of Qatar to withdraw because uh, the uh, statute of the uh, GCC uh, says that there should be a unanimous decision when it comes to the expulsion of one country from the GCC. And I do not think that the decision makers in the state of Qatar are thinking of that. So leaving the GCC is a, a wrong decision par excellence. So the GCC in its current makeup, if it is not useful, it would not harm you. There are benefits on the contrary. There are benefits. So many Qataris believe that exiting the GCC would be exiting the trusteeship, the hegemony that impedes the independence independence and ambitions of the state of Qatar. The state of Qatar has taken a different pathway economically and politically, and still it has not withdrawn from the GCC as a council. If we do that. So we have a model, which is Oman, which has its own independent pathway, does not pay heed to what is taking place, yet it is still member of the GCC. What are the benefits that are going to be reaped by the state of Qatar, the Qataris, if they leave the GCC as a council? No, nothing, nothing. I have a conviction, and many do not agree with me. The depth of the state of Qatar lies within the GCC as council. Yes, there are alliances with Turkey. Turkey, there are great relations with certain European countries, but at the end of the day, the strategic depth of this relationship would only lie within the GCC as the Council. But since the GCC has lost its compass, uh, the state of Qatar has the right to have new alliances in order to achieve its own and keep its own stability until the situation goes to what it used to be in the, in the past. Uh, I know there are so many Qataris wants to, want to leave the GCC, not because they are convinced. So many of them, they do not know the statute of the uh, of uh, the the council so the discourse has degraded a great deal so taking the Qatari people uh, from that uh, so let's keep let's keep the problem diplomatic why have you gone down to the popular level to the people's level so why have you done that the family the unified family that is made up of so many countries why would it fall in what it has fallen I think the difference has uh, uh, made the Qatari people not wanting to become or to be part of this system. I know the feeling. The feeling is a kind of an emotional feeling. If we rationally deal with it, we could see that it is an option that is not a right one. And I do believe that there was a pressure to gain uh, the Qatari people, to gain their uh, support, and then the society, the community would collapse. Those communities are not used. The Qatari community is not used to that. When they they were they were expecting a collapse, and that would be uh, reflected and would impact the leadership, and then the leadership of Qatar would go back to Saudi Arabia for Saudi Arabia to do what it wants. But they realized that the contrary, that's what had happened. So when uh, this uh, kind uh, of scenario had uh, failed, uh, they tried to go into other means and ways. Uh, uh, they went to Muqtada Sadr, to other uh, uh, entities in order to find a solution to this matter. So they had only one uh, scenario.
very quickly. The GCC is going to host its summit in December. How is this uh, summit is going to take place? Uh, how are they going to solve the issue of a state such as the state of Qatar, which is blockaded by its own brothers from the GCC? I do not think that our foreign minister is going to uh, decline the invitation or the attendance of this uh, summit. I think Qatar is going to attend, but I do not know whether the others are going to have reservations vis-a-vis -vis its attendance. Uh, so before the meeting, I think there are going to be changes, particularly in September. I think there are going to be some variables, some changes that are going to push uh, the crisis within a certain direction. So I do not think that the situation is going to continue as it is till December. There are going to be some changes, some variables, maybe that would speed up the process or maybe the contrary even but i do not know what they're going to do thank you so much thank you dr naif maybe the crisis would change from now till the summit so dr frehat from the doha institute for graduate studies maybe was going to talk about the changes the variables that are taking place here in the region thank you very much dr abdullah I would like to thank everybody for attending, being interested in such a seminar. I hope that uh, I have what remains to be said after the two interventions of my two colleagues. Uh, I'm going to try to concentrate on the security dimension of the crisis, its impact on the region as a whole, and on the GCC in particular. I would like to concentrate on the security aspect. There are five or six point that I would like to concisely be able to talk about in the 10 minutes allocated to me that would summarize the security dimension of the crisis that we are living. The first point, amongst the security repercussions of the crisis, it led to the splintering of the security apparatus in general of the GCC. And it had also some impacts on the region as a whole. So this region relied from a security perspective on one security component since the 90s, particularly after the Kuwait invasion. So they had one uh, component, one aspect that they relied on, which is the United States of America that was in charge of the security of this uh, area this security monopoly from the part of the u.s has been targeted has been undermined in this crisis and the united states of america is no longer the sole security vendor or provider for this region what we are talking about we are talking about military bases in the state of qatar uh, uh, military turkish bases in the region and we're talking about lavrov who is talking about mediation intervention in the crisis that is taking place we're also talking about the possibility of an intervention of iran in the near or far away future and maybe we can even talk about Egypt, Pakistan also intervening in the region. So we had one provider of security, one vendor as it was expressed by the speaker of security. So now we have different vendors as expressed, different providers of security. So is this something good? Is it something bad to have uh, a certain monopoly of one great power or to have multiple providers, multiple vendors of security. Maybe this relies and is based on how we deal with the crisis theoretically at least, or economically, there should be different providers, different vendors. This is something positive from an economic perspective. Economists maybe can correct me in this particular aspect. Yes, it is healthy to have different providers, different vendors, because this is going to increase the level of competition. It will increase also the choices that the uh, users can have. Uh, 
maybe it is in the interest of one country or a number of GCC countries, it would be in their interest to break the monopoly of the security coming from one country, which is the US. But this aspect also has a negative aspect and it has so many uh, threats uh, as well. These security providers, when they come to a region, they come with a number of interests. Uh, so there are a number of expectations that should be taken into account. They do not provide security just uh, from the standpoint that they want uh, to uh, do good to those countries. No, there are interests. Uh, this is not a philanthropic kind of endeavor. And also we have to take into account that the relationship between these different providers and maybe this region would become a kind of a battle ground due to the level of competition that is going to increase between those countries that are investing from a security perspective in this country and they are not going to depart in an easy way. So this multifarious, this uh, diversity of security provision would have some threats, some dangers when it comes to the region in the long run and uh, maybe it would make the region a land of competition, a land, a battlefield. And this would be inimical to the GCC. I hope that the d decision makers would be aware of these uh, dangers and threats. And this leads me to the third point, which is self-security. And the solution is not by relying on security monopoly on one provider of security and not in having a provision from different uh, sources in one of the sessions that have been convened uh, by uh, the Institute. We talked about the security challenges that are being uh, imposed on this uh, region and we, t we talked also about security monopoly by the US and the solution to this challenge is uh, to have a certain kind of self uh, security, a GCC security, to have independence in political decisions. Uh, so there is no substitute to developing the security level and here I would like to give an example. I do not think that there is a strong relationship between two countries, such as the relationship between US, the US and Israel. We know the aid that is being given to Israel, but despite all this strong relationship, uh, the, uh, the Israel had never tried not to be independent from a security perspective. It has developed its own tools. Uh, that is why the GCC should develop their own personal tools, their own tools that would give it a high level of independence on other grounds and aspects. Uh, so moving from one provider of security, moving towards uh, self uh, provision of security, we have retreated one step to the back. Uh, now we face uh, different sources of security and this has led to competition in this level. And this is what had Dr. Neville, uh, Naif sorry, talked about and I would like to underline it here for you to develop your own security capabilities. There should be a kind of a political framework. Uh, you cannot just uh, develop this framework like that. You have to have a certain framework and this framework is the council, the GCC council. Hadn't we had this uh, structure, this framework, we cannot build anything. Uh, you cannot build security. So the most dangerous thing that has uh, happened as a result of this crisis is the targeting of this union, of this council, the framework through which we can build self-defense, self-security. And this has been targeted and we have retreated a step to the back. And now we are facing differences of sources when it comes to security provision. The other point that I would like to talk about is the aggravation of the situation has led to, had led to other crises in the region. Where is Syria today? Where is Yemen today? Where is Palestine? In the aftermath of this crisis, uh, a year or two or two, three years ago, we all remember 
that those who were taking decisions with regard to Syria was the G was the GCC. From the part of the opposition, it was Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and so on and so forth. They were holding talks in Riyadh and elsewhere on behalf uh, of the opposition. Maybe I think the most or the happiest person with regard to this crisis would be Bashar al-Assad because now uh, the GCC countries are very busy with their own affairs, internal affairs, and therefore not paying heed to the situation that is taking place in Syria. At the end of the day, those who sit uh, and negotiate are those who have their own interests in such negotiations. So the Syrian dossier and the talks that are taking place in Astana. So there is no GCC presence in the Astana talks. Even the GCC presence in such kind of dossier is no longer there. We now have an Egyptian role that is inheriting the GCC role, and now the Egyptian system regime is uh, talking about uh, those negotiations. We are now talking about uh, a Cairo platform, about uh, uh, talking about legitimacy and representation of the opposition, Syrian opp opposition. The Egyptian regime or any other regime who would go to negotiations would set their own vision, their own perspective, and maybe this perspective is not necessarily in keeping with the interests of the GCC. So maybe this is going to be in agreement with the vision of Egypt if Egypt takes over in such kind of platform. There is a complete withdrawal when it comes to the Syrian dossier. We have seen also a retreat in the Yemeni situation. So there was supposed to be a kind of solution by rebuilding, enhancing strategic security by finding a solution to the Yemeni situation, but the situation has aggravated and uh, Qatar has withdrawn from the battlefield and the crises in the region have deteriorated. The fifth point that I would like to underline here, and as somebody who is specialized in conflicts and conflict management. I cannot but talk about this uh, particular point. I would like to talk about it very quickly. And this is of concern. Uh, it is of concern, a great deal of concern to us. Uh, from this crisis, there was a change in the uh, in the value system in the GCC, its mechanisms and the way it deals with crises in general. Many talked about uh, military solutions, and that was insane when it came to this uh, 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 crisis. Uh, this council that has been established uh, on security bases, uh, on containment of uh, Iranian threat, Iranian expansion, how would it be solved militarily? We know we as Arabs how we deal with crises, we try uh, to uh, please the other parts uh, in order to solve our crisis. I think we all agree that there is no, no military option here. Uh, but to try or to uh, talk about such an option as one of the options, I think, in my opinion, was, uh, was a jump in the air, especially when it comes to interstate conflicts. Uh, so when can we remember or maybe try to go back to history and remember uh, crises between different uh, Arab countries? Maybe we can go back to the era of Kuwait and the crisis that was there at the time. So there was a change in the value system. And uh, I think there are so many threats and concerns, and here I do agree with Dr. Naif by saying we have moved to the level of governments, to the level of people, and not only the level of people, but also the level of the value system. And this is of concern, of great concern, and I hope that we would be aware of such a point. This is going to be last point, the last point, I do promise. The taboos that have been broken by this crisis 
uh, and it has not been broken in actual fact, but there, is, there are talks about that. Talking about alliances with Israel to reach a point, and once again, I do not think that this is mature enough, at least not explicitly. I do not think that uh, there would be such a kind of uh, alliance between uh, uh, or uh, between Saudi Arabia and Israel. Uh, this is a matter that would lead to breaking so many taboos. Uh, I'm not talking about something that has happened. No, but if it happens, then we would be starting to talk about uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, political uh, atheism. atheism, if we may call it so. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Ibrahim. I have a question that relates to what you have just raised, which is self-security. There are many people talking about self-security. And you just uh, cited one example uh, about Israel that achieved its uh, self-security and there are other uh, regimes and other systems uh, that do not want the U.S. protection. Today, superpowers such, such as the United States and uh, Europe, they cannot achieve their self-security and they are under the American protection. Uh, could you f explain further what do you mean by self-security? Can Gulf countries achieve self-security through a GCC system or through a different mechanism through the State of Arab Le the, Le the League of Arab States, maybe the Islamic organization? This is on one side. On the other hand, how can we achieve a self-security in the Gulf whereas there is a mistrust among the leaderships in the Gulf. Security can come through only through politics or through a framework. How can we achieve? Thank you, Dr. Abdullah. I think in the first part of your question, and you answered the question, so I think it's not a matter of potentials, the issue, it's a political decision. A political decision, First and foremost, uh, I have uh, never imagined that we can uh, uh, go to, uh, to, you can build the uh, self-security in the uh, Gulf region if you just attack one of the uh, country which is a member in the GCC Council. In the security theories, this cannot be. Yeah, you, how can you build a security system and on the other hand, you can attack the others? The issue of security, actually, I agree with you. Theoretically, there isn't a one country that can achieve its self-security by itself or absolutely. It's a matter, it's a relative matter. But today, Dr. Abdullah, I, I mean today, uh, Israel has ended the new F-35 deal with the United States. Uh, and uh, uh, amounting to seven billion dollars in order to enhance its security systems and add to that the uh, nuclear aspect so potentials are there every there is there in the gulf but the solution uh, what is uh, we need the political frame at the gcc council and the uh, material and the scientific uh, uh, ingredients are there. The, the GCC started maybe since the early 80s and you took a long time to build, not only at the GCC level. When the nuclear Iranian, uh, the Iranian nuclear deal was signed and there was much speech about that, whether that was a good deal or a bad deal, Whatever you say about the deal between Iran and the West, but in the end there is a very important point that it gives you a 10-year period that there will be no uranium enrichment in uh, Iran so, so that you can build yourself 
potentials within those 10 years so that you can just uh, uh, build up similar to what Iran is doing. Now, two years elapsed, and instead of jumping forward towards building a self-security, we started to attack each other, and we just started hostilities with each other. And when the basics are lost, and instead of building yourself, you just attack a country uh, which is a member in the GCC, I think this is another diversion. Now, do you think that Iran would be a part of the Gulf security system? Yes, very natural. It, since the Shah, it has been part of the political of the security system in the uh, region. And now I talked about the diversity of the security vendors and the providers. Now, no, the, now there are no taboos in the vendors in Iran, in Iraq. And I think that the door is wide open now in that regard. And it can be in other directions. Thank you. Finally, last but not least, we will give the floor to to now uh, it's enough for politics and now we move to uh, economics and we would like to talk about the impact of this crisis on the region's economies uh, and Dr. Nader Kabani uh, from, from Bookings Doha. Thank you, Dr. Abdullah. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful prayers be in our noble prophet and his companions. I am required today to talk about the economic aspect of the Gulf crisis. And also, in the beginning, I'd like to shift the speech into the period before the eruption of the crisis. Uh, let's have an idea about the uh, status of the Gulf countries just three months ago. What was the economic situation at that time? We know that the Gulf is passing through an economic crisis. Uh, at uh, Whether the uh, drop in the oil prices or the natural gas, now the oil prices now are almost half of the prices as they were by end of 2012. And also the drop in the natural gas prices up to 35% less. This all has led into different consequences uh, and other economic aspects and the crisis affecting the Gulf countries. So just a general idea about the oil prices and if we uh, can look at the, uh, what we call them in English is the, the statistical equilibrium in the oil prices so that to have a balanced budget in that. Currently, the oil price is less than the price in the oil country, in the uh, Gulf countries, except Kuwait. All Gulf countries, uh, they uh, try to plan their budgets based on the new oil prices. This uh, has resulted into different instances in the, at the economic level. In May this year, the IMF. Uh, estimated the growth rate in the GCC countries will be less than 1 percent during the year 2017. And with the crisis, maybe it will go lesser than that. In addition to that, the Gulf countries are trying to diversify their economies in order to ease their dependence on natural gas and oil. Uh, estimations in for uh, growth estimates in other sectors other than oil and gas, uh, three percent the growth rate. Now in the non-oil and gas sectors, uh, so that uh, to sh help the countries to move from depending on the oil and gas economy into other kind of economy. We have also some projects have been stopped, also termination of uh, some labors 
uh, also reduction in our downsizing in the labor market and also in decreasing the lowering the salaries as well in addition to other challenges changing and developing the institutions all gulf countries suffer from the weaknesses weakness of their institutions look at the development outcomes education outcomes uh, the w women unemployment so maybe uh, they are higher than the world average except for uh, except in Qatar and all this gives us an idea about uh, the challenges or the big challenges that face the Gulf countries before the Gulf crisis, the recent Gulf crisis. What is the benefit of this discussion? The main objective behind this, all these challenges and other challenges require an economic, economic cooperation, institutional cooperation, security cooperation among the GCC countries so that the GCC come over these challenges, they should cooperate economic-wise in terms of a trade, investment, uh, uh, exchange of experiences and the prof uh, professionals, institutional cooperation. The question that poses itself here, if this is what is required, and now what has happened is contrary to that. The Gulf crisis now, It, there has been a political difference which should have been solved through diplomatic channels. But the political differences and conflict uh, uh, maybe took other dimensions uh, as abusing and damaging other economic and social interests. The question here, what, what is the goal behind the continuation of this uh, crisis? And is there any interest for the blockading countries? Uh, what is the what what is the cost of this crisis? In in addition, this is the question. The reflection, the economic reflections and impact of this uh, current uh, crisis. The crisis is costly on diff on all parties. First, let's look at the at Qatar, the state of. Qatar is passing through the crisis or in its first phase. Uh, we have seen this uh, in terms of the absence of some commodities, uh, uh, high prices in different for different uh, sort of some commodities, and also it faces some challenges in regard to investments and uh, savings. Uh, and this is on the short run. What is the result, or what ha the re for the state of Qatar? the revenues of the natural gas and the sovereign uh, fund that amounts more than $300 billion. There has been a shrinkage in the liquidity and in order to compensate for the absence of some companies. We know that the state of Qatar has the potential to face the, all those pressures which have been imposed on it. So we have seen the security market in the first days of the crisis. It dropped by 10 percent, but it, it is still there. Uh, with the passage of time, when we talk to business people or the businessmen in Qatar, now some of them uh, they are importing uh, commodities. Uh, they are suffering from some prices. But the vision or the perception in general, after some or many months or a few months, uh, they will find it through or they will find other supply channels. The, they will approach the manufacturers and the plants in the West or in the exported countries. And this will lead into a reduction in the cost of the commodities, which will reflect positively on the consumer. Even the low cost can amend the increase, uh, uh, the increase in the price of the transport logistics. So what is expected uh, there, there uh, it is expected not only there will be uh, more stability, but there will be an increase increase in Qatar's ability uh, to accommodate or to procure the commodities uh, easily and also to increase the 
come to this and by the end to uh, have uh, um, to, there will be improvement on its economy at the long run. Uh, and this is what expected by the businessmen in, uh, in Qatar. And uh, as uh, the case uh, in Iran, the economic b boycott or blockade uh, has strengthened Iran's economy. It is clear also that the crisis uh, it has a co economic cost also on the blockading countries, Saudi Arabia, uh, Emirates, Bahrain. In, in, in terms of what? From which perspective? Uh, last year, the uh, the trade uh, balance between Kurdistan are amounted to about ten billion uh, dollars. Uh, maybe this, uh, these opportunities and opportunities of investments, maybe tens of billions of dollars. Uh, some of these opportun opportunities ended now. So the cost on uh, the economic cost of the crisis. Maybe Qatar bears a part of it, but on the long run, it will affect the neighboring countries. Back to the main question. Does the public interest for this crisis uh, coincide or commensurate, or does it have a positive uh, uh, impact on prolonging the crisis in economic wise no the, con the conclusion would be it is in the interest of all to solve the crisis as soon as possible and to focus on the facing the security and economic challenges that faces that face the region we will not get into the details now, into the figures and uh, what would what would be the consequences if uh, if the crisis continues on Qatar and on the neighboring countries. But the uh, uh, the in terms uh, economic wise, it is costly for all parties, and it is not in the interest of any party. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nader, for shedding light on the economic perspective of the impact of the crisis on the GCC countries, Qatar and the blockading countries. So the question that comes to mind now, what is economic cost? Who is the winner? Who is the loser in this crisis? It is known that in crises, there are winners and losers. Uh, in your opinion, what are the winning and what are the losing countries, in addition to the U.S., of course? U.S. is winning, somebody said. For the re GCC countries, I think all countries are losers when it comes to the region. The countries that are part of this blockade, Saudi, Bahrain, Emirates, uh, and even Qatar. The, cu the countries that are under the banner of the winning countries is Oman. Oman now has a logistical center for the exportation of uh, goods and uh, services. Uh, Iran, Kuwait, Iraq, of course, uh, uh, maybe. The countries that are not part of the conflict, to the issue that is taking place, uh, because Qatar is uh, substituting the goods and services it is exporting from the Emirates and Bahrain from other countries, and the geographically closer countries are the ones that are winning and benefiting from that. Dr. Nader, what is perplexing when it comes to this crisis, as you said, as you mentioned, the economic uh, situation was uh, degrading as the result of the drop of the prices of oil. And the crisis has aggravated the situation, has aggravated the economic impact and the losses that are uh, being imposed on the countries of the region. I do not see any security or economic logic 
in such a crisis? How can you explain it, at least from an economic perspective? There were talks about this particular issue, and the, the panelists talked about that. They said that there was a plan during the first days of the crisis uh, to have uh, escalation from the blockading countries uh, uh, trying uh, to win the support of Trump for him to have a supportive position in this crisis uh, and they try to pressure Qatar to accept their demands but this didn't happen for many reasons uh, the defense department uh, Qatar, uh, sorry, the Trump, uh, their position was different. Uh, and also, the people in the Emirates, uh, in Saudi Arabia, they had their own position. And we have seen that manifesting in the different social media. There was a reaction against the other people. Why is this happening in the month of Ramadan? So I do expect that after these first days of the crisis, it was realized that the plan is not going to follow as it was expected it to follow. So the question, why have they retreated? after these political pressures, after the pressure of uh, having a military intervention, why they have not retreated after realizing that these have proven not to be useful. So we, or it was found out that there was a political cost to that, a security cost to what is taking place on the shoulders of the blockading countries that are part of the, of the blockade. That is why there is a possibility, there is an opportunity to find a solution because there are costs and there is no interest uh, for this uh, crisis to continue. Is the economic reason is part of the solution or is the it would be part of that. The economic pressures that exist uh, and Qatar due to its uh, economic position, its uh, material capabilities and natural resources that enables it to overcome the challenge. The same applies to the Emirates, uh, but Bahrain and Saudi Arabia are weaker than the first two countries. If I do remember well, the oil price for Bahrain to be in a good position is $100 per barrel. As for Saudi Arabia, is $80 per barrel, but for them to face the reality of a $50 per barrel uh, constitutes pressure on both countries. So this uh, entails that there should be quick solutions for them to be able to overcome the issue. Thank you very much. Thank you to the different colleagues present with us here. We talked about the crisis. We talked about the ramifications of the crisis. I know that there are so many questions in your minds. Uh, it, is not, it is time now to listen to you, the audience, your opinions, your questions. I would kindly ask you to introduce yourselves and to be as brief as you can. Go ahead. In the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful, Zakaria Matar, an economic consultant. Dr. Abdullah Baboud, you talked about an e a political and ethical issue that has nothing to do with logic and there are three points terrorism should be discussed the rules of terrorism how it appeared and economically me as a consultant i say that there is a wonderful opportunity for qatar to rectify its economic position through three main pillars which is tourism and highly sophisticated industries technological, highly technological industries. And also renewed energy is the third uh, sector. The state of Qatar should concentrate on these three fields. You forgot about uh, the deal of the century 
what has been planned for in Abbas Kamil's office has been planned for by uh, Mohammed Dahlan. This is not ethical. This is too childish, the deal that was uh, concluded in uh, Egypt. Please introduce yourself. May the peace of God be upon you. Barka El Merri, expert in social media in the Ministry of Education. And I am a person who follows the crisis and its ramifications. I have a question. Unfortunately, I have not attended the first part of the seminar, so I didn't have the chance to listen to the first interventions, but I have come to ask one question. I have only one objective. Uh, yes, we do understand the ramifications, but very briefly, I am here to have a answer. What is your appraisal, your evaluation of the crisis management that took place? Uh, and we have gone through a crisis and we know that the culture of crisis management is very limited in the Arab world. So what is your evaluation of the, the state of Qatar's management of this uh, emergency crisis. We talked about the economic, the ethical, the social and political aspects. Uh, I would like to talk about crisis management. The second point, what are the methodologies, the channels uh, that can be followed by the state of Qatar in managing this crisis uh, in the future for it to be able to present a good model, a model that can be benefited from by other countries in the Arab world and in the Middle East. Please introduce yourself. I would like to take another question. Mohamed Abbas from Egypt. You posed the question at the beginning to Dr. Shafiq Ghabra. You told him what is the reason behind this crisis. I think this crisis started in 2011. Uh, in the uh, Arab Spring and the support of the state of Qatar of the Arab Spring, what was clearly present, they felt a threat. Uh, they felt a threat vis-a-vis -vis the change that was taking place. This has led to the counter-revolutions uh, that uh, continued, the military coup that took place in Egypt, try to undermine uh, uh, Qatar after the political change that took place. Uh, it happened, but they were not able to continue due to the presence of uh, Obama. Yes, Trump played a role there, but the basis was there for the Emiratis and the Saudis. Uh, and also we should not forget uh, the rise of Mohammed bin Salman and the plan that was concluded with Mohammed bin Zayed and the uh, coalition or alliance that was uh, concluded uh, in order to put an end to change uh, and uh, that, uh, the so uh, that Qatar uh, supports uh, Muslim Brotherhood. No, they do not want the change that is taking place in the Arab region. Part of it is the Muslim Brotherhood group. Uh, and this is part of a campaign of uh, counter-revolutions in order to break uh, the Qatari political will. We have another question here. in the name of Allah, Dr. Muhammad Amrah, Qatar University. In fact, there, there is an important aspect that we need to focus on and to give great importance, uh, which is the ethical dimension. The crisis implies an ethical element. If we just consider the time when the crisis has been caused is an ethical dimension and especially the Islamic ethics. If we also consider uh, the, the, the spark that ignited the crisis can be attributed negatively into the ethics. At the same time, if we assess the Qatar's crisis management at this level, we notice that at the speech, at the political narrative, or at the media narrative, maybe it, after one month, month, it has been quite ethical in terms of the crisis management. And it gave the political decision maker 
a good political and ethical position that can be followed as a model in addressing any problem in the Arab world. Therefore, I think that any planning in the future to address problems or to rebuild the GCC Council, this issue must be taken into account account because it is the ground and the psychology upon which Arab and Islamic communities are built. So the ethical management of the crisis, I think that was quite unique and just I wanted to make it more clear or clearer, but time uh, does not allow. And another question here. And then we stop to for further comments. Bilal Sadiq. I have an inquiry many resources mentioned on the role of the natural gas for example Egypt Emirates depend on the Qatari gas and there was a possibility for further agreements with Iran for uh, gas pipelines and the LNG markets and the uh, U.S. competition. Is there a possibility to look into or to analyze or to address the role of the natural gas in the crisis or not? Here. Hello? It looks like that the blockading countries have only one plan, which is a plan A. So inviting uh, Qatar uh, demand for dialogue and negotiation from the very beginning. It was not the crisis of Qatar in as much as the crisis of the blockaded countries. When Qatar asked for negotiation and opened its uh, and expressed its readiness to go for dialogue and to and with the Kuwaiti mediation and all the other developments and the other mediations today, there is a Russian mediation. It seems that mediation will continue and continue because solving this problem is a defeat for the blockading countries. It is a defeat announcement for those countries because the dialogue and uh, by uh, with the blockading countries implies two factors. They claimed uh, that Qatar supports terrorism, and this is something which is uh, quite relative. And as Dr. Naif mentioned, it can be looked into from uh, more than one aspect. So uh, the demands they demanded, for example, uh, they they themselves have the same, for example, they have Al Arabiya satellite uh, channel or media network. Uh, and there is a double standard here. Therefore, any solution will be a great defeat for the blockading countries, and that will not be announced in public. A question here, a question there. I would like to listen and to, uh, to look into the crisis. Is it a passing or it is a, just a coincidence, a crisis, or, or a simple crisis, or if there are other differences in regard to the definition, in regard to the who is the enemy, this could be solved. But the crisis will not be solved if it is activated by the outsiders or if it has further dimensions with other and external factors. If we talk about the American and the U.S. administration and the, uh, other forces uh, outside the Gulf, maybe the uh, crisis could be uh, everlasting uh, like the Palestinian question and also the crisis the Gulf crisis will be just uh, not about 
solving it, but how to live with it or how to manage it. His Excellency, the Ambassador here. Thank you. Two uh, questions. Some think that the roots of the crisis uh, can be attributed to the Justin in the United States. Any comments by the speakers? Uh, also, some of the analysts think that there is a deep cause that is not disclosed about for this crisis where competition on the future of the world because some of the blockading countries depend on oil and that uh, and that uh, and that source is being depleted any comment on this as well thank you i have a question and and i think it is relevant to the issue The question is, do the Qatari people, the government and the people, uh, are, are they ready to stop their successes that they have achieved? Because when you are realized or when you achieve success, there are people who may envy you. And I think that envy stands behind the crisis. The successes that Qatar has achieved in the media, in the economics, uh, in uh, hosting the FIFA 2022, and uh, will Qatar, will the Qatari government stop these successes? One of our sisters in the back. Shukran, Isbi Amal. Sorry, I'm only speaking uh, English right now because I don't speak Arabic. Sorry, guys. Can you? Uh, uh, yes, there, I think everybody. Is that speaks. fine? Yes. Okay. So basically, um, we, we've been talking about the security, economic issues within the region as well as in the Gulf. However, we, we also discussed on Palestine, as well as Israel and um, Syria. However, if you look at the spillover that he had uh, within the Gulf crisis and security-wise within the Horn of Africa, I think no one has really mentioned the issues that's going on with the Horn of Africa and the effect he had on the region. Uh, as you know, the, um, what's it called? Um, so basically, Eritrea as well as Djibouti sided with UAE and uh, Saudi Arabia, while Somalia and Sudan sided with, mm. it became basically mutual. So my question here is, um, I mean, so what are the measurements uh, and policies which you basically um, advise on the Gulf um, on how to basically um, have, because um, if you look at the Horn of Africa, it had a, a massive humanitarian impact as well economically and security wise. So how would you advise uh, the Gulf on, uh, as well as the policy measurement, would you have, um, um, I mean, especially security-wise on the Horn of Africa? There is a bit of echo uh, um, sound, so it's difficult to, to get your question. Can you write it down in a piece of paper quickly and send it to us? Uh, Reem? I will, yeah. Reem? What are the guarantees that this crisis will not be repeated in the future, especially we are dealing with Qataris which are not politically mature and in terms of their perception about the political movements of this crisis, either we all submit to their policies or block it over the country as the case happened with Qatar. Muhammad Abdullah. The media talked in details about the causes behind the crisis, but the most important uh, issue is that many intellectual factions in the Arab world, why is this mood against the Muslim Brotherhoods? And my question to Dr. Naif, why do Muslim Brotherhoods are categorized as a group or as a terrorist group? 
أنا سفير جنوب أفريقيا في دولة قطر أود أن أعلق على ما جاء من المتكلمين فيما يخص سحب ترشيح وهذا الفشل في العلاقات بين قطر is a very difficult issue to address globally. So I'd like to hear the comments from the panelists. Thank you. Sheikh Hamouza, you have been talking about the issue. Do you think we have any other urgent question? Uh, young lady there. And you can start there by the two gentlemen next Assalamu to each other. Assalamu alaikum. Yasmina Benani from Qanat Al Jazeera. أنا بس عندي سؤال بسيط لماذا يخاف ال ال one question why does the Gulf fear Iran very important question أنا من جامعة جورجتاون أود أن أضع سؤال فيما يخص إيران إذا استمرت ال المقاطعة على قطر و does Qatar have any alternative but much deeper cooperation with Iran, economically and otherwise? And on the other hand, what are or what should be the limits uh, to such cooperation? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, yes, the gentleman next. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. name of Allah, most gracious person, Khalid Hassan from the World or International Union of Islamic Scholars. In the... F my brothers, first of all, Qatar has succeeded as it now realized what are the qualities of its neighboring countries. Because Umar ibn al-Khattab said that Arabs they are good and, and as long as the rulers of Qatar have known the ethics and the habits and the customs of their neighborhoods, they knew how to deal with them. The, there is an important issue that should have been focused on, and I don't know, that is the dispute or the, the question, in my opinion, is personal. And each one has his own perception. Those who read the history know that the Emirates, when the people of Qatar did not exceed 10,000 or to 15,000 people, the Emirates, they attacked Qatar. There is an ancient or an old dispute or difference that agents uh, uh, such as al Utaiba, the, em the Emirates ambassador to the United States, and Israel, who blend, who blends for the Russians and for the Americans, and they, uh, it is a must that their uh, interest will be achieved. So Trump said that Qatar has to r respond to the orders or to the requests of the demanding countries. And the speech is quite clear. So the international game must be taken into account. And things should not be taken uh, into account in terms of economics. If the external countries, maybe the crisis will end in one day. And you know this. The last question. Hello, peace be upon you. Sadiq Abu Nafis here from the Strategic Studies Center. The, this crisis, in my personal uh, opinion, it, I think it is an American-made crisis. 
And I think that the Arab world since the 70s, America stands behind many problems that took place in the Arab world. Abdel Nasser, um, America was against with him. They, the United States does not any strong country with an independent uh, decision or will. And Abdel Nasser was assassinated. Then King Faisal was assassinated and was killed. Saddam Hussein, he also was thrown away and was killed. I think that the United States stands behind this crisis and distracting the Arab positions and the stances. Uh, the last point, please. I want the panel to comment on the, that the more The more pressures are exercised and the more the longer the blockade is, I think Qatar as has been said, it will be more and more going to Iran. Uh, we want the panel to comment that will there be uh, uh, an alliance between Iran, Russia and Turkey could that alliance include Qatar uh, as well in addition to Syria? Now, what is the shape or what is the form of the future alliances in the region? Thank you. Go. So these are questions that have been posed to the panelists, and there are some other questions that we have received. But unfortunately, we have received the sign to put an end or to come to the end of this uh, seminar. The lady asked a question. Security and economic issues. Well, what is also the difference between the GCC countries and the blockading countries, particularly Al Bahrain and Saudi, that have uh, led the state of Qatar try to understand the feelings of those countries? But now uh, we have seen uh, the economic impact. So the question seems not to be very clear, as the uh, moderator says. So he's talking about the impact on the people and diplomatically. There are so many questions, so many ideas that have been expressed. Uh, unfortunately, the time is very tight. We maybe do not have the time to answer all the questions. We're going to try to be as concise as we can in uh, dealing with these questions. We're going to give the floor to Dr. Shafiq first to intervene. There are so many things that we can deal with. There is nothing final or decisive at the end of the day. So there are so many points that can be taken into account when it comes to understanding this uh, crisis. What is very problematic is that crises in the Arab world maybe come when things uh, are dark, uh, unseen, and then they leave in the same circumstances. Uh, so there are so many dimensions that should be taken into account. If uh, we have a referendum convened in Saudi and other countries in order to understand the opinion of the people regarding this crisis, maybe we would have listened to other companions, opinions that are different from what is being dealt with. People have different opinions when we talk about ethics, morals and politics, ethics uh, and uh, the crisis uh, and also political money this all leads to so many questions. Uh, uh, the idea or the issue of Muslim Brotherhood is not the main problematic issue. It is a political faction. I think they should uh, concert their rights uh, to work uh, as such. Uh, but this is being used uh, as a way of inciting others. Also, terrorism is used as a means of inciting others. There's a kind of use, uh, legalizing the use of such a thing. Uh, 
giving the rights to those users to use such kind of thing. Uh, there were a number of ideas that have been uh, mentioned regarding the management of the crisis. I think the state of Qatar has managed the crisis in uh, a manner that is not Arab at all. Uh, we know that uh, Arabs, when dealing with crisis, they are very emotional, uh, but we did not see that. Uh, we have the Ahmed Saeed uh, method of managing uh, crises, but Qatar has managed the crisis in a different way altogether. What I fear is that uh, when people are provoked, uh, they become a little bit uh, nervous, maybe emo emotional, but they were balanced and measured. Uh, they tried to contain and absorb the situation, and this should be clarified all the time. The crisis is not only a passing uh, crisis. I can perhaps say that, but I do not see the components that would make it as such, even if it pacifies, even if we reach moderate solutions to the matter. I think there are so many deep matters. The transformations are uh, uh, very deep when it comes to this crisis, but uh, we have to say that there is nothing constant. Everything is changing in the Arab world. Uh, there was a question, is that uh, the United States, uh, did it play a, 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 a role? Uh, uh, was it uh, colluding in such a, a matter? Uh, yes, the United States of America is a state of institutions, but uh, Trump uh, is in a country that is losing its position. It's uh, position that we used to know in the 60s and the 70s of the 20th century. What has happened had happened. Yes, the United States, uh, 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 Trump has... Uh, diverted the pathway of the United States. So many institutions were not pleased with his uh, uh, take, uh, and uh, perhaps the situation is not going to continue as such. Yes, when you listen to the uh, Secretary of State, you would see that there is disparity and difference. Uh, and so many institutions took part, and this shows that they were a kind of uh, uh, trying to uh, limit uh, uh, the endeavors of Trump in such a matter. Yes, gas played a role, money played a role. Uh, then it was always a concern when there are adventures taking place in the region, such as uh, the Yemeni adventure. Yes, it is natural that there are going to be so much uh, expenditure. In general, wars are a failure when we try to study wars. Uh, in 10 wars, you would find one successful war, but most wars uh, are a failure. They start with a perception. Even if you go back to the uh, world wars, you would uh, realize when you study those world wars that they could have been evaded and the number of people who have died. Uh, so they start uh, very quickly and then at the end of the day, they are not decisive by the end of it and then you find that your resources become depleted and then you try to resort to other sources uh, and resources. Yes, uh, the state of Qatar has been facing a uh, kind of a de facto situation and uh, maybe the lesson that should be learned that great powers should contain, should understand, should accept difference, should accept diversity, they should coexist. We have an example before us which is the European example. Europe was facing so many wars. Uh, uh, they, the Europeans, they respect uh, differences the existence of other small countries such as Monaco and other countries. So the way the situation was dealt with shows the fierceness of methodology. We Arabs in general, I'm not going to be specific to one country, we are, we are fierce in the way we deal with matters. Even when it comes to a football match, we might be very fierce vis-a-vis -vis each other. I think we need to change the culture, we need to change the politics. I think we need to uh, include the public opinion. I think people should take part in the writing of constitutions, irrespective of how much uh, mistakes are being committed. We need CSOs. Uh, I think we are uh, sliding here, uh, and I think we need uh, to uh, try to find solutions. Yes, there was an opportunity which was the Arab Spring, uh, and uh, we do not know what the coming opportunity would bring uh, and what kind of losses would uh, come with it. 
right. Uh, so we have seen so many factors, so many factors. Uh, so sometimes you try to please the United States of America just to uh, find solution and to put an end to the issue that you are facing. But with regard to Iran and the GCC countries, and this is going to be my concluding remark, I think this is a long-term story. This is uh, a very old story. We can't fall, forget the uh, Iraqi-Iranian wars. It was expected to be solved in a few days, and it lasted eight years. And this has led the crisis based on which we have seen so many other ramifications. And we hope that we're not going to fall into that period. Yes, you might disagree with Iran when it comes to Syria and Iraq and so on and so forth. This is your right. But try not uh, to say that Iran is in charge of all the problems that are uh, happening. You have to rationalize your relationship with uh, Iran when it comes to GCC crisis. Try to be rational. Crises should not be open crises. Look at the crises between Russia and the United States of America. There are disagreements, but there are agreements on other platforms. I think we need to rationalize matters. To rationalize matters, we need institutions. We need also institutions and individuals that are part and parcel of the problem that are taking place. Maybe Dr. Shafiq has answered most of the questions, but the last point attracted my attention in regard to our rule. Uh, we always look uh, to look into differences. Many does not do not know that Russia and Iran that look ally alliances they have substantial differences among them, and they don't maybe maybe the, there is a black history between them and big of. Uh, conflicts between especially dominance over the Mediterranean uh, and also the uh, gas that has been adopted by the Revolutionary Guard. But they know that there are other interests that exist between them. On the contrary, we have the common grounds, but with the first dispute, uh, there has been a certain odd in, in that. In regard to for the question on the Muslim Brotherhoods, they do not threaten uh, Emirates. The Emirates cannot look at the Muslim Brotherhoods in order to achieve certain interests. They consider them that they are a big problem and maybe they are more dangerous than Daesh. Just uh, look at the volume of the expenditure that has of the uh, uh, expenditures that the Emirate has spent to fight uh, Daesh. Maybe they, the Emirates spend more than that to fight the Muslim Brotherhoods because uh, the Emirates think that the Muslim Brotherhoods are more dangerous than uh, uh, Daesh. And this has also uh, shifted to Saudi Arabia. If we look at the common grounds, because uh, I don't uh, just represent myself, uh, and the uh, common ground between Daesh and the Muslim Brotherhoods, Daesh wants the kill, the kill. Uh, uh, and what does the, the Muslim what do Muslim Brotherhoods uh, record? Um, also, they want the, what we call uh, the caliph, and, and uh, but the Muslim Brotherhoods want that peacefully, but Daesh want that like, by using the military. So the military, the, the, the Muslim Brotherhoods would like to reach or to get power peacefully. And so it is for this reason that some of the countries think that they are the threat against their ruling systems. Uh, now the West fought Daesh. And, uh, and the, the West does not interfere in, the, 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 in fighting the Muslim Brotherhood. Now this conviction has been with the policy makers in Saudi Arabia and the decision makers. Uh, in regard to the why does the Gulf fear Iran? Are you from Morocco? Why do you, why do you fear uh, the Polisario, for example, uh, no, in, in, in Algeria, they do not fear the Polisario. When you ask a, a man from the Gulf, why do you fear Iran? Uh, it's the same question as you ask a Moroccan, why do you feel or why do you fear the Polisario? Okay. Maybe both of them want to take something that has not been taken yet. Uh, the controversy or the problem with the Iran now. Uh, uh, maybe the Arab revolutions have opened the door before the Iranian to exercise some dominance over some Arab countries. Uh, 
the Iran's problem is that their constitution legalize the interference in other affairs. And this is what confuses the Arab uh, world. And the Arab world has not been able to exploit this and to convince. I do not see that Iran is the greater uh, threat. And we need to discuss this with the policymakers and the decision makers in Iran. In regard to the United States, I think that we exaggerate. I do not think that the Americans fabricated the story, but uh, maybe they have interest behind that. Uh, many people talked about the causes behind the crisis, but if we want to understand the real reasons, we, we should ask about the interest and the benefits and what would the decision maker in Saudi Arabia and the Emirates, what interest they will gain. All the interests or the benefits that they will gain may reflect on the reasons. So it is not necessary that there is only one cause behind the crisis. Uh, no, uh, maybe Mohammed bin Salman. Maybe it's a group. Uh, it's a group of reasons or uh, uh, or and causes. So many factors may form a certain phenomenon. But what aroused the problems that uh, now they they just. Uh, uh, wanted to depend on Trump, and Trump is part of the scene, but not not the whole uh, the scene. The uh, other institutions in the United States did not support them, and uh, maybe also the resilient of the state of Qatar, and it does uh, as it did not collapse in the first week because the blockaded countries were thinking that Qatar would collapse in the first week or will surrender in the first week. Uh, the third element that the United States and the Congress. Uh, did not accept or approve a cancellation of the agreement or the Iranian uh, deal, and this and by this they may hit two birds with one stone. So when the Congress refused to cancel the Iranian uh, deal or the Iranian uh, nuclear deal, now Saudi Arabia started to look for mediation with Iran and the Trump let them down, now they started to blame themselves, and this is what explains the request by the Saudis for an Iraqi mediation with Iran. Thank you, Dr. Naif. Dr. Ibrahim, I would agree with my colleagues be with all what they have just said, but I, would, I don't want to repeat what they said, and I may address the questions that have not been answered. And uh, in regard to the Horn of Africa, I don't know whether the ladies is still there or not. Uh, yes, uh, based on our studies uh, of conflicts, when there is a dispute, uh, it could uh, it could go for further expansion on or what we call conflict widening uh, and taking with it other elements. So it would have a power to attract other elements, and this is what literally took place in the uh, first days of uh, the crisis when there was some pressure exercised on certain countries and the African horn was not away from uh, that. Uh, and also it faced certain pressures in order to join the blockading countries or this uh, conflict. The ideal solution in for the North Africa and North Africa to distance themselves uh, from this crisis and should not support one party against the other. Uh, this might not please a party or the other, but I think this is the, uh, the, the thing that they should do till the crisis is solved. But if you take a hasty position, uh, or if you support one party against the, uh, the other, this will be registered and recorded by the history as we have uh, we have just seen uh, shared what when they closed the Qatari embassy and uh, here there is a big problem if you join this. Even if the pressure is great, it is better to distance yourself from the crisis and not to support any party against to them. It's better to be neutral. And this is good for also, it could be more beneficial for the crisis in the Gulf. The narrower is, is, is better. 
uh, in regard to the just a bill and uh, 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 well, uh, what America you are talking about, this is the first America that we see in this form. We used to see America in a different picture and shape, or uh, there is the overall America, the establishments, the institutions, and, and there is a Trump. And, uh, and I think that we all agree that this crisis should, uh, wouldn't have started unless there had been a green light from the uh, Trump administration or from Trump himself. So, and this green light was not institutional. It was coming immediately, uh, maybe, maybe the, it was derived by the JASTA law or JASTA bill, regardless what we call it, whether JASTA or not, but it is the same idea how Trump uh, just uh, addressed this uh, crisis. But I would confirm uh, that uh, that uh, U.S. stance was not institutional, and we have seen some divisions in the positions and in the statements. The crisis management, I would like to affirm again, uh, and uh, uh, I very much like the expression by Dr. Shafiq. It could be a non-Arab style or uh, manner to how to manage this crisis because Arabs are emotional, uh, but uh, exercising a certain balance uh, and uh, cooling down and uh, rationalization also played a great role in the success in, uh, of managing this crisis. You need to keep quiet and you have to maintain the moral aspect of the crisis management. The complementary part also, you do not confuse papers. You need to squeeze the conflict in the files or in the main points. And also, this is not a, a, an Arab feature. Because when there is a conflict or a dispute between two persons, we usually burn the ships. Uh, there is a political difference, and then we close the ports and the land and the sea and the land borders, and we dismiss the camels. What is the relation? Uh, what? what uh, even the camels were affected by this crisis. This is the uh, Arab stereotype in managing a crisis, and I think this is a great mistake. So we need to separate between the files and the issues. In our, uh, we need to address only the file where the crisis lies. The issue of uh, the America and Iran. Um, America or the United States imposes uh, uh, sanctions on Iran's many years, or maybe since uh, 30 years. So difference on how to finance the uh, 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 for example, financing some uh, uh, any terrorist activity. Uh, so if the problem is on the uranium enrichment, maybe it does not have any relation or any impact on our cooperation in Afghanistan. So uh, isolating and maybe uh, addressing each case by case or each issue uh, is uh, very much liked. And uh, there is no need, for example, if there is a dispute between two persons to, to burn the ships. So there are certain mistakes on both parties. Iran has problems in its foreign policy, such as building the military militias in Syria and Lebanon. And, and also Saudi Arabia has also problems, such as the refusal of cooperation and negotiation, because through negotiations, problems can be solved. To what extent? Uh, that the relation between Qatar will, uh, and Iran in disputes, there are no limitations. If you have noticed, in the first days, uh, there was not a speech about a relation with Iran in regard to this crisis. Even when Iran uh, uh, was, uh, open, uh, expressed readiness to open its three ports, there was not a Qatar rush. Then the, there was uh, other economic problems, and then resumption of the diplomatic relations, and the Qatari ambassador went back to Iran. So the more the crisis uh, uh, is tough and severe, 
I think there we will see further developments which could be further or other than security agreements. And the blockaded countries are watching and uh, observing that. And uh, and you should you will not be surprised because this is the result of conflicts and there could be many uh, surprises and there is no exception that can lead into uh, cooperation. The last point, will this crisis continue or it's just a, a very simple uh, issue that can uh, end shortly? No, all indications say or, or indicators uh, say or show that the crisis will uh, uh, be uh, long uh, and uh, we have a good experience about the Arabic crisis that I call something volcanic uh, crisis that erupts all, uh, all at once and then the other day when on the over the phone maybe uh, every, uh, uh, everything is settled or as we as in the crisis that happened uh, that uh, the crisis uh, all of a sudden uh, the blockaded countries close the borders close the airspace uh, close the ports uh, and the other day uh, sometimes uh, you can see everything is uh, is back to its natural condition in settlement the settling or in the settlement of arab disputes uh, Sometimes there is a great role for what we call the face saving. And at some point, the, we should remember that this fact may be helpful or this factor may be helpful. If you provide a certain kind of face saving, uh, may help in solving this crisis. Thank you, Dr. Nader. And we now give the floor to Dr. Kobani. The answers were wonderful, and the answers were more wonderful. And here I focus on the economic aspect. First of all, in regard to the crisis management, it has been quite uh, success, uh, successful and wonderful. Uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, the communities are there, and the consumer goods are there. Uh, uh, there is a stability in the market, investments, projects are ongoing, uh, and they are followed up very well. And even we expected that there might be or maybe stoppage or uh, suspension of some uh, projects. No, on the contrary, now we see that all the projects are ongoing and uh, at a good pace, and things look quite natural economic-wise. As for the priorities uh, in the future for this issue, the doctor here said uh, the necessity to define the strategic sectors that Qatar should invest in, and this is very important topic in case of in, in regard in terms of funding, how to attract the foreign investment, and uh, how was uh, the, the, if we just consider the case of Singapore. Uh, in the 60s, uh, uh, when they just uh, were in dispute with uh, Malaysia in the 60s, uh, they focused on different sectors. The second one is to activate the investment institutions such as Monotic and Qatar Financial uh, Center. Uh, those institutions can play a crucial role, and we need g to give them a, a further role. Uh, the last point. to trust the business environment in Qatar. We need to consult with the international organizations such as the World Bank and the, maybe the World Labour Organization uh, the, to, to import some ideas and to seek some advice and policies. And it uh, this also enhances Qatar's relation with the international institutions that are connected to other world countries. And this will improve the image and the role and the position of Qatar at the world level to build new relations and other friendship relations, friendly relations. This will help Qatar to come over the crisis and maybe to move towards the upcoming phase through building new relations that uh, help Qatar may advance. These are the, the points from an economic point of view. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Uh, Nader. There are more questions that we cannot answer because of the time constraints. Uh, please apologize us uh, uh, or excuse us also. We tried to answer all questions, but uh, because of the time constraints, uh, ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, uh, this uh, respected audience, thank you very much for being with us this evening. This crisis is not a passing uh, uh, crisis. It has been now for three months. Uh, it is expected to continue for a certain time in the future. And I think that seminars of this kind would uh, be very much uh, uh, beneficial and to that may shed light on this crisis and to understand this is not the first attempt. Uh, there will be other seminars in Qatar University and other workshops to address this crisis and to understand it. There will be certain uh, communication uh, with the researchers, with the students, and we are very much delighted to cooperate with the Brookings Centers uh, Qatar in conducting such seminars. And we would like also to thank Al Jazeera Satellite Channel for casting this uh, seminar. And uh, now I received a letter from the from the interfaith uh, the S dialogue uh, center in Doha, inviting you uh, to attend a seminar on the role of debate and dialogue in solving problems, and it will be in Hilton. This confirms that that Qatari institutions and that after the summer vacation started seriously to address this crisis and to find solutions for them in the future. Uh, again, I would like to thank you, and uh, please, uh, uh, we would like to thank the speakers of this uh, and the panelists of this seminar. Thank you.